Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast with Kevin Harrington and Seth Green. Kevin Harrington is the inventor of the infomercial, one of the original sharks from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and has generated over $5 billion in TV and digital direct response sales. Seth Green is the world's first trusted authority on cutting edge direct response marketing, a best selling author, and the only three time Marketer of the Year nominee. On the podcast, Kevin and Seth interview sharkpreneurs who share straight talk on what it takes to explode your business. Why do so many businesses struggle while others seem to explode overnight? Do you wish you had the secret to this type of exponential growth? Now, I've scaled more than 20 businesses to over $100 million, and it's not just luck. In my new book with Mark Tim, Mentor to Millions, you'll learn the repeatable framework I use in all my business ventures for massive success. Order at KevinMentor.com and get over $1,000 in bonuses. Head to KevinMentor.com. Welcome to the podcast. This is your host, Seth Green. Today, I have the good fortune to be joined by Seth Nelson of Nelson Coaster, a Tampa-based family lawyer known for devising creative solutions to difficult problems. Mr. Nelson focuses on Florida divorce law, family law, and family law mediation. Seth, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. All right, so let's go back in time a little bit. Um, you're in a helping profession. You're having, you're coming up with creative solutions to difficult problems. What inspired you to go to law school? So my mother was a lawyer. Her older brother of 17 years, her, her senior was a lawyer. My grandfather on her side was a lawyer, but most impressively, my grandmother graduated from Fordham Knight Law School in 1925. So, wow. And as not surprising, she couldn't get a job because she was a woman, um, but it was in the blood, no matter how much I resisted it, destined to be. Wow. Okay. So you come, you have a long line, a long family legacy of attorneys. So you certainly had great role models, but why did you say some kids would have gone the opposite way, right? Some would have said, oh my God, there's a family of lawyers. I want to do that. I want to go rebel. How come you chose? What inspired you to say, I want to do that? So I meandered a little bit. I worked for six years before I wanted to go to law school. There was always this kind of drive uh, for me to do well in whatever I was doing at the time. And I found myself working on Grand Cayman for three years, helping kids and kind of being in the social services situations, um, helping kids on that island, which was in a beautiful place. But I just always felt this urge that to help on a bigger scale. Um, and I thought understanding how the law works and kind of pulling back the curtain on that um, would help me be able to get on board so I could help at a bigger level, be able to help people on a personal level, but still get in the courtroom if you need to go there, um, be able to mentor young lawyers, which I love doing, which grows my firm, which helps us help more people, which is ultimately what we're here to do. And if you do all of those things, then you can grow a successful business. And I enjoy doing that as well. Absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. So how did that, how did the focus in family law come about? So I started my own practice 13 years ago. I was kind of dabbling in a couple different areas of law. A lot of people said to me, Seth, you should do family law. And I initially rejected it. Oh, it's emotional. They're like, well, you're good with helping people. You may be able to calm those emotions. But then I also looked at it from a business perspective. One, if your spouse has a lawyer, you're pretty sure you're going to get one. Two, you get, from a lawyer's perspective, four out of the five issues that you deal with are all financial. We have kid issues, not necessarily financial, but we have division of assets and debt, financials. We have alimony, financial, child support, financial, attorney's fees and costs, financial. And I'm a numbers guy, and I like that aspect of it. And I also like that you got all that information from your clients and the other side. You can know whether they can afford you or not. The downside of a family law practice is I'm not doing, let's say, foreclosures or collections where I have a big bank sending me a thousand cases a month. 
they if you're done right they're one hit wonders you're in you're out you hope you don't get frequent flyers but we do um so you always have to be on your game you always have to provide great service to those clients because you know the modern day word of mouth is google reviews and online reviews and those speak volumes so from a business perspective i liked all of those aspects of it while still getting to help people on a one-on-one -on -one basis still getting into court if i need to because a lot of these big cases on civil cases they, they you do all this work and then they sell which is great i think settlement is great i'm not saying that it's not but i also do enjoy being in the courtroom if i have to go but i prefer not to okay that makes a ton of sense what are some of the biggest mistakes people are making when it comes to you know family law separation custody all that good stuff the biggest mistake i see on a daily basis is letting your ego get in the way it is a legal issue it is solving problems there is no fair there is no justice there is no fourth of july in apple pie get all those concepts out of your head you have a problem, you are married to someone that you no longer want to be married to, or they no longer want to be married to you. You have been married for X number of years. You've commingled your finances. You've grown a business during that time. You have debts to divide. You have emotions that I grew this business. It should be all mine. She never worked in the business or he never was a part of it would always complain when I work late, why do they get the benefit of my hard work? The law doesn't necessarily see it that way. So I like to help people to limit the potential damage, explain the law to them on ways that might actually keep more of the pie for you, but people's egos get in the way. They want it all. And I will explain to them, listen, your pie is so big. We can argue about it, and I might be able to get you more than half of that pie at the end of the day, but more than half of that pie at the end of the day is going to be smaller than you taking 40% of the pie today because it's going to get eaten up with attorney's fees and cost, distraction from your business, loss of revenue from your business because your focus is elsewhere and not on your business, not on your customers, not on your team. There is a bigger picture here than just the division of assets and the divorce that you're going through. You're absolutely right. Now, obviously at Sharkpreneur, a lot of our listeners and viewers are entrepreneurs and business owners. When there's a business involved, how does that change the whole family law picture? In Florida, it yes, is- we'll give, we'll give everybody the disclaimer that you right. are in Florida <laughs> and that if they're not in Florida, they should seek counsel in their own state or someone licensed there. That's right. Check your local jurisdiction is what we say all the time. But the concepts are the same. It's a division of an asset. The question in Florida, in, in, in most states, is going to be how much of that, if at all, is marital to be divided versus non-marital, which might not be divided. It just might be yours. So by way of example, in Florida, if when the day you got married, you owned a business and its business value is a million dollars. Now it's 10 years later, you've worked that business, you've grown that business, and that business is now worth $10 million. The question becomes on the growth, the 9 million bucks, is that the marital pie? So now man, you owe your wife 4.5 million to buy her out of half of the business? That would be, in my hypothetical, your worst case. But we have to understand what do we mean by value? How does it get valued? There's different ways to value businesses. And if you're doing an asset approach, it doesn't matter about you. It's what are the assets? What are the debts? Sell it all. That's, the, that's going to be the lowest number. But if you're doing times earnings, but the other thing to think about is how much of that business in Florida is your personal goodwill? Seth, if someone comes to you to create a podcast, they want you. They want you to be on that show. If you said, hey, yeah, great, but I'm going to stick you with this other guy, Seth, they're going to be like, wait a minute, right? That's called personal goodwill. And how much of your business is really you? Customers are coming because of you. If you go to get your hair cut and you sit in that chair and it's not the normal guy or girl that cuts your hair, you're getting up and walking out. 
that's personal goodwill. In Florida, that is a non-marital asset. So you take that $10 million valuation in my hypothetical, we already know a million bucks is yours, but let's say 40% of the 10 million is personal goodwill. Well, now I got your 5 million bucks of your company that's worth 10. Maybe you got a pair of 2.5. Maybe there's some other adjustments to be made, but you have to understand how businesses gets valued, what parts marital, what parts not, and go from there. Figure out how much you're arguing about before you go argue. Okay. So you, I mean, we could spend the whole pod talking podcast breaking down that answer because you kept crammed so much information in it. Let's go with your worst case scenario. There was 9 million worth of growth. We've established that that's what it's worth and that the spouse now says, you give me four and a half million. I think the worst nightmare part of that is how do we preserve the business? How do we not have to sell it to cut that check? How do we work around that if I don't have four and a half million dollars in the bank, if it's the business is worth that, but that's not in the bank, how does that get paid out without put, making the business go for a fire sale? It's an excellent question. There's a couple different ways to do it. One, in our hypothetical, there's only one asset, a business worth 10 million, she gets 4.5. If that is the only asset, then maybe you pay over time because you tell the court, this is my livelihood. Oh, and by the way, I need to pay alimony. I can't pay alimony unless I have my livelihood. So I need to pay this over time. So you can do that. And that might be at a relatively low interest rate. Um, so that's one way to do it. The other way is, can you go borrow some money? pay it off. Okay. The other way is if there's more than one asset, let's say you've got a house that's worth $2 million free and clear. She gets the house. Now, instead of owing her 4.5, you only owe her 3.5 because half of that house was yours. Do you have retirement worth $2 million on retirement? Remember, we have to look on whether it is gross money in retirement. Like let's say it's a brokerage account that has 2 million in it. Okay, how much she gets 2 million. But if it's a retirement account that hasn't been taxed yet, we have to look at tax implications. But if there's other assets that you can shift to her side of the equation to keep your business, then most of my business owners are gonna do that because they know in the long term they can go get another house. They can go build back up their retirement. They can go build back up their brokerage account those things are easier to build back up than your business. Absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And obviously you need an expert in the area to help you determine all of this in the least painful way to get it taken care of. How are your clients finding you? Uh, modern day word of mouth. Um, my big joke is, did you Google short Jewish bald lawyer? And you came up with me because I'm first on, uh, on Google on that page. Um, but modern day word of mouth, Google reviews, I'm at nelsoncoster.com. I have my podcast on how to split a toaster. It's all a divorce podcast. Um, and, you know, we get awards and we're very active in the community and I've been doing it a long time. And so I get referrals from former clients. I actually, which is not as uncommon as you might think, Seth, I just got a referral from an opposing party. So I represented the husband. The wife referred me her best friend. So even though they were at opposite ends, theoretically, you still got a, wow, I'm not sent. The wife didn't send her best friend to her lawyer. She sent her best friend to you. Yes, exactly what happened. Why? Dumb quite Why wouldn't she? Send, so obviously, did she like you better than her lawyer? Maybe. And speak to her directly. Um, right, yeah, you this don't has know. Happened, this has happened more than once. And I, I, you know, what my, what people tell me is like, hey, he did a really good job for my spouse. Um, go hire him. I thought he did a better job than my lawyer. The wow. way he saw me in court or whatever the case may be. Um, I've also had people say, I sent my best friend to you because I know my spouse was really difficult. And you got the case settled because sometimes I have to protect yep. my clients from themselves. Sure. Um, 
so there's all different ways that cases come in. Okay, so that's amazing. Um, how to split a toaster? Great title. Tell what inspired you to start a podcast. Talk a little bit more about that. So many people are going through divorce, and there's different divorces that they're going through all at the same time. There is the legal divorce, which is a it is a legal case. There's the emotional divorce that I don't think family law attorneys speak to enough and un have to understand and connect with their clients where they are emotionally. A lot of that has to deal with fear. The business owner fearful of losing his business. How do you deal with that? Um, maybe the spouse fearful that she's not going to have the same type of lifestyle that she had. What about the kids? Um, there's all sorts of fear and emotions that go in and I just wanted to give back. So I just put it out there. We've had an amazing response. We have great questions coming in from people, as you know, from all over the world that listen. Um, and it's just really started taking off and we just really enjoy doing the show. We've got great guests that come on. There is a whole really strong group of women helping women through divorce. There's not as many male voices in that space. Um, so we're helping the guys come along too. Um, and it's just been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Awesome. We'll tell people to check that out. You've achieved so much success over such a long period of time. What's your biggest challenge now? Uh, we, we work really hard on managing growth and keeping quality. And while doing that, we work extremely hard on our culture at the practice. So we have some sayings that we really live by um, as a team. A couple of them, for example, are everybody's responsible, but nobody's to blame. We're all human. We make mistakes. How do we as a team deal with those mistakes? And we will sit around our conference room table and say, here was the mistake that happened. How or what could have you done differently to prevent that mistake? Um, it might be that I didn't check my calendar because I kind of got engrossed in some legal research, let's say. And I was late on a phone call with a client. It could be something that simple. We'll sit back and the, the legal assistant might say, you know, I, I didn't notice your light go on. Or I noticed your light wasn't on on the phone. And I didn't think like, hey, aren't you supposed to be on the phone call with a client? So I withheld information because withholding and seeing a train wreck coming is just as bad as causing the train wreck. So I think managing growth, managing quality, managing the culture is something that takes up a lot of our time. But ultimately, if the team's not on the same page, we're not going to be able to help these people through these difficult times. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Your passion is obvious. I know that you are um, a longtime committer of improving yourself, of working on your personal development. What are some of the best books you've ever read? Oh, um, so I can't say Fifty Shades of Grey, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different type of development. <laughs> I'm more of um, a learner by doing and hiring coaches than um, just flat out reading. Um, I think there are a lot of great self-help books. I am more of a connect with people. So by way of example, when we talk about culture, uh, we hired Gallagher Edge, Laura Gallagher, who is a PhD and IO, industrial organization psychologist, who I work with um, on a monthly basis. And if I need her more, uh, more, and she creates environment for my team to have open, honest, what we call green line conversations. So that's how I kind of um, like to grow and like to work. I hired a personal um, trainer that my son and I have been working out with for a year over COVID twice a week um, via Zoom. And then the gym opened up and now we're, we're meeting him on Zoom. We're, my son's taking up rock climbing. I'm going to hire a personal coach. I'm not going to go read about how to rock climb, but that's just how I learn best and learn most quickly. Um, and, you know, I read a lot during the day. I read a, a lot of news articles and I'll read a lot of kind of articles about business as opposed to digesting a, a, a full book. Got it. That makes sense. You're more experiential, learn by doing. I, I totally get that. For our, we know that your time's incredibly valuable. Your folks, for our folks who are watching and listening who want to learn more about you and the firm, uh, please tell us again, the firm website and where they go to find out about the podcast as well. 
So the firm website is nelsoncoster.com. That's N-E-L-S-O-N-K-O-S-T-E-R.com. And How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast, is on any social media, wherever you get your podcast. Um, just Google How to Split a Toaster, and we're coming up first. Um, and, you know, leave a question and leave a review if you like it. We're just here to help people, and we get a lot of great questions, which then, of course, spark full episodes. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here. This has been Seth Green with Seth Nelson of Nelson Coaster and How to Split a Toaster. Seth, thanks again. Thanks for having me. It was great fun. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. We'll see you or talk to you next time. Do you need money to fund your idea, product, or service? Are you ready to take your business to the next level but need capital to get it done? Kevin Harrington has heard more than 50,000 pitches and knows how to help you make the perfect pitch to get the funding for your entrepreneurial dream. He's distilled the process down in his perfect pitch cheat sheet, and it's yours for free. Just text PITCH to him right now at 727-888-2100. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 right now and claim your free perfect pitch cheat sheet. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 to start funding your dream today. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.